Paul throughout this chapter is saying that you know we want, we want followers, not fans. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean we want people who just get out there with a the rule book and say, I've got to do this, 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 and better behave. His point is that the way to be what you ought to be as a Christian is to actually be in practice, in reality, what God's already made you in Christ when you become a Christian in the first place. The big question then that Paul seems to be Paul seems to be saying is not what are the rules, but just who is this Jesus I'm following? Because if you're not clear on that, you can't follow him. Just who is he? Chapter 1 of Colossians. And who shall I be conscious of having become in Christ? That's chapter 2 of Colossians. And then chapter 3, today, spell out the implications of that for how we're going to set about doing things. So, who is this Jesus I'm supposed to be following? Yeah, we've done that. Secondly, who have I become? When I become a Christian and start to be following him, what's happened? Something's happened, there's a new man, there's a new creation. Okay, so what happens then? How do I live on the basis of that? Well, that's chapter 3, and Paul is, is spelling that out. He does that in terms of what we must pit, put off and what we must put on. And we used, was it last time we used the analogy of when you come in from the yard, you've got your boiler seat, you've got your overalls, you've been out in, in the yard with the animals, with the tractor, whatever it is, you come in and you drop your boiler suit by the, by the washing machine door. If you're well trained, you open the door, shove it in. Turn it on the top and off we go. Yeah? Yeah, you're smiling because, yeah, we've been there. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, if you're well trained, that's what you do. But you come in, you drop, you drop the kit because it's filthy. And off it goes. Paul is saying, put off that old man. You know what he's like. We've read the list of things in the, in the passage of the scripture we've been looking at. It's an ugly, messy list. It's something we all fall for, but it's something that causes such a lot of pain, suffering and difficulty. We know. We know that. We live long enough. We know that sort of thing. Drop it. Just drop it. There. <clears throat> so we dealt with him last time. We dealt with him what he was kill off really what you must drop off and we're looking today verses 12 following at what you put on instead what are you underneath and then what you put over the top of it what you've become you become a new man in Christ we're a new creation to the book. there's been this radical change there's been this radical end of that way of life and the start of this way of life but there's more to it than that you've been made new in Christ something's happened in your heart something's happened to your constitution if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old's gone, the new's come. You become a new man in Christ, a new creation, and you become followers of Jesus, not fans. So says Paul, go check in the mirror of God's word and live in the light of what you see of yourself. First of all, he deals with who you are. Here's the underlying anatomy. Who am I? Oh dear. We do with the light. Not better, is it? Ah, how disappointing. You wouldn't believe how long it took drawing that little figure in PowerPoint. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> you can see what's there. That was an awful lot of lighter blue when I did it. Oh dear. There you go, little fella. Who am I? The key to going out and acting and living like a Christian, we're being told by Paul, is who am I? And then how do I express that? The underlying anatomy. Mercifully covered up, the portraiture begins with anatomy, doesn't it? Therefore, as God's chosen people, here's who you are, holy and dearly loved. Chosen people, holy and dearly loved. <coughs> the emphasis is not on me, but on God who said, Hey, you. You. Imagine being at the concert as a fan, right? There you are at the concert, <laughs> Sunday mornings. There you are at the concert as a fan, okay? Somebody in the band. Say, hey, you come here, come on, come here. You come here, up on the stage. Were you listening to Radio 4 yesterday? Ah, oh, well, it's all been about the magical mystery tour. Beatles' magical mystery tour being on the telly or something. Don't know, I haven't seen it. Uh, but they were, the way they made that was they were off on the bus on tour as the Beatles in the early days and uh, they got a bunch of girls or a bunch of fans or whatever. I suppose most of the Beatles fans were girls, weren't they? For my time, I have to ask. I've got that one in. <laughs> That's tough. So um, they got the secretaries of the fan clubs and all the rest of it. And they were selected and they were taken on the bus on this tour making the film with all this. We've been picked. Oh, I'm somebody now, because I've been on the bus. 
Well, there you go. God's gone along to, as it were, the concert with the fans on the Sunday morning, and he's gone. You're one of those God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, says Paul. Now, that word has got a, a great big history in the Old Testament, but quite a history in the New Testament. But generally, it's emphasizing God graciously taking initiative, drawing men and women to himself, and putting them right, justifying them in his cause. That, not guilty. Chosen. Those chosen people, holy. Here's a good one. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, <clears throat> we all know what it's like to have been caught out and to have actually been in the wrong. <clears throat> maybe you've been in a position where we should have gone back, maybe you have gone back and said, look, I am sorry, I was wrong. I've been caught and you're in the wrong. <coughs> More difficult is the one where God separates you out and says, Look, my declaration against you is you, you're in the right. You're holy then. I need to be a holy person, set apart. That word holy is, you know, got visions of angels and cherubs and singing and stuff. Um, it means set apart for God. Set apart for a plan and a purpose and for a mission and for a set apart for God. The essence of being a follower of Jesus is that you're one of His. He's pulled you together as a group of people maybe and He's called you to be set apart, to be distinct and about His work. It is the nature of things. It's not the means by which we earn or merit God's goodness. It is of the nature of having been made one of his people that is set apart for his work in this world. Set apart, chosen, holy, dearly loved. Because along with that personal choice and that set apartness, Paul brackets God's love. He's done this because he loves you. <clears throat> Very easy, perhaps when things are not going great in life. It's very easy to, to get into the um, mentality that this isn't fair, but sometimes it isn't fair. Maybe it's not fair at all. And it's very easy then to get into the pattern of thinking, God doesn't, God doesn't like me much at all. Mm. Dearly loved us, Paul. If you're a Christian believer and he's made you this, then you are worth something. You're worth something to him and you're powerfully treasured by him. You're dearly loved by him. And you can see that from, uh, from the way Paul talks when he's having a hard time of it, when he's banged up in jail, when he's unjustly whatever. Singing, praising God at the late night, and meeting God in the prison cell, whatever it happens to be. So there's the underlying figure. This is who you are, and, and you need to work that out. Says Paul. This is who you are underneath. You're God's chosen people, you're holy, and you're dearly loved. That's the underlying figure. We're going to turn from the underlying figure to the way this underlying nature gets displayed in the, in the world because there's clothing that's on it. Isn't that a great thing? Clothe yourselves, says Paul, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. And I know we're all thinking, ouch, because we haven't always been. But the Christian should no more go out into the world making a big display of his personal privilege, that underlying stuff, you know, chosen, holy, loved by God, should no more go out making a big display of, look at me, I'm special for this, than if you walk down the road in his underpants, you've got to clothe those things. Clothe those privileges by behaving like this. The Christian is those three things, chosen, holy, specially loved, but covers up decently before going out for a walk, and isn't going out saying, look at me. He's going out and doing these things. And these express then the underlying nature. Clothe yourselves with compassion. There you go. <clears throat> that. Compassion. Nothing like a hat is it? Like a good hat. Hat is very important. As time goes by, a hat gets more important, not less. <laughs> I think in the old thatch department, you're all doing a bit better than me anyway. Clothe yourself with compassion. This clothing is yours, given to you already. It hangs in the wardrobe of your entitlement as someone who's chosen, set apart, as holy and loved by God. It is yours. It's in your wardrobe. It's part of the new nature. Put it on. 
It's given to you. It's yours. It's as much yours as the new you Paul's been describing. Put it on. What does it look like? Well, <coughs> compassion. Um, see, we've got this word compassion, and Paul is working with another language, and the language he's got for this is um, quite a basic language. There are two words that go together. Uh, splankna oiktomu. And uh, splankna is, is your guts. You know when something is absolutely gut-wrenching, you know what that means, yeah? Uh, this, this is the sort of word he's got here. The authorised version, the old authorised said, bowels of compassion, right? You think, ooh, that's, that's a bit grim. <laughs> what an expression is that? Well, it's actually, it's gut-wrenching compassion. Gut-wrenching compassion. Deep-seated, powerfully wrenching compassion. Seeing another person in need, seeing another person going through it, and feeling deeply moved to reach out to them in love and in care. Think about it. What do we know about Jesus? Did he sit on his seat in the comfort of heaven and let down a rope ladder so anybody who fancied the chance to be an utterly spiritually mobile could start climbing? He did not. Maybe he rolled down the ladder but he came down there himself and he came into the mess and the difficulty of the situation. He showed compassion and pity and sympathy. It meant that he started climbing down into our mess. Not up and away from the unpleasant spectacle of, of, of earth and its thrall and sin, but down the rope and in because he was moved by what he saw, gut-wrenching compassion. That tells you something about God, he's the father of all compassion. The father from whom all compassion comes, and not his fans but his followers, are being appealed to by Paul that just as they dropped the dirty clothes of the old man, there at the washing machine door when they came in the building, now they put on the compassion of Christ as they're covering, presenting the privileges of the believer to the world compassion. And with that powerfully motivating sense of compassion comes this. Kindness. Sorry, you've been small. I can't see the small. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought I wasn't going to bother with that, don't need it. Move on. Scrap that bit, it's too small. <laughs> kindness. Put on kindness. That's your call. It's up to you. But there's the implication of it. Look, he's shown such compassion for you. He's shown such kindness. Stay it on. It represents the new man that you become as a Christian. Be kind. We, we, don't, we don't use sermons about being kind much, do we? Oh, if we do, they're of the sort of, sort of, you know, a bit aniseed and you just... <sighs> kindness, kindness. It's a torn thing, you know. If God has come into this world to show us kindness, and love, and love, and love expressed in kindness, then... These people are unkind. That's just a complete, not even a miscommunication, it's a communication of the wrong thing, the wrong truth. Put on kindness, he says. What's the matter with that? It's a big theme in the Psalms. In Jeremiah, it's particularly amazing because God shows such kindness in spite of the sins of his people. Kindness, it's, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Some good old-fashioned kindness. Clothes compassion, kindness, humility. There is a good one. Humility. You see it in passages like Philippians 2, it stated that Jesus had humbled himself even to death on the cross. And as a consequence of that, God has highly exalted him. Humility. Following him, if you're following him, that's precisely where we're going. Don't be so with humility, because above all else, that's what he's done. He's taken him being God, stuck in heaven, he's come out of heaven and put upon himself the form of a servant. That's humble. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness. Protest, gentleness. Uh, meekness in the old translation, what's meekness? Do you remember an advert for cigarettes a long time ago? Meek but not mild. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Shame range. I show my age. It happens all the time. You've got to look at me. Well, meek but not mild. What's meekness? Meekness isn't weakness, is it? Meekness is... Well, weakness is the score when strength is lacking. Meekness is strength that's restrained. It's discipline that it's restrained. Meekness is strength restraint. Calvin had a drenching sheet yesterday. Uh, they don't like having their medicine. 
but they need it. They've got, you know, they pick up fluke and worms and they've got to be done. And we just ran them into a loose pen. Instead of just, you know, jamming it all in and grabbing them, we just ran them into a loose pen. And just go to each one firmly under the chin, without violence, without any sort of evening and sweating. Shoot a good dose of fluke and worm down each neck. Okay, push. There you go. You're done. And it could have been much harder work. If we'd been shouting and grabbing and levering. But it takes strength to be gentle with them. You've got to be strong to be able to be gentle with them like that. That's protest. Strength restrained. And Zechariah 9 9, that's the title that's given to the Messiah, to Jesus, as an honour. He's the one who brings in the kingdom of God, but he does it without using force, describing himself as meek. He's strong enough to do that. But the idea of strength that I could exert, that I could use in my own interest, that I could throw my weight around with. But I'm going to consider others, and I'm going to show a willingness to waive my own rights and not assert myself. And finally, in this list of five things to put on, to express your privilege in Christ, we come to this one. Patience. Patience. Now, <coughs> Macrosthubia is not the sort of patience that does the crossword, right? It's not that sort of patience. It's long suffering. It's the long suffering that endures wrong and puts up with all sorts of exasperating conduct from others rather than fly into a rage or set in your heart on vengeance. You know, how many times would it be possible to get this one wrong this week? If you want to display, you should display your privileges in Christ, in election, in sanctification, being particularly loved by God, then this is where you go. You put on these five attitudes. You learn from the Saviour, you're following. You're not a fan, you're a follower. And you pick up these characteristics of him and you put them on. You put off the old guy, and we know what he's like, and you put on this new man that's being renewed in the image of its creator, it said at the end of last week. Didn't it? This is what he's like. These are the clothes we now put on. They're the things that are ours by virtue of what's been done for us in Christ. What a gap, what a huge gap between a fan and a follower. Because of what's been done then for the follower of Jesus, these are things that such followers must put off, the things of the flesh, like dirty overalls by the washing machine door. But what's been done for us in Christ, there are fresh clothes to put on again too. And they're all things that come to us because we're following Christ, and Christ is all of these things. Now that means, briefly then, this is how you do it. That's what you put on and this is how it shows. This is what we do because you put that new man on. You bear with each other. <clears throat> Interestingly, that verb has got linear connotation. It's a word with a linear connotation. This goes on. And also it's in the present tense. So this is an ongoing activity. Right? We go on bearing with each other. It's got to be enduring. And of course it's a reciprocal word. Both ends of the, both ways. And if they're irritating to you, of course, it's very likely that you're irritating to them. You know, we've, we've perhaps lived in close contact with people, and uh, <coughs> perhaps over, uh, over close contact for comfort. And you think, oh, this person is getting right on my nerves. Uh, mm, yeah, it, it happens. Am I, am I getting up yours at the moment? I go, well, no, we look then, perhaps I have. <laughs> Think about what the Lord had to deal with. We're, we're living with a church, right? And you can walk into some churches and churches that are, you know, fans, not followers, or they're doing all sorts of other things instead of following Jesus. And they're there, these institutions are there. And you walk in, but they don't like each other. And you know as soon as you walk in. They really don't get on. They don't get on. They can't bear with one another. They can't bear each other, in fact. And that's, that's miles off where we ought to be. And we're not giving many excuses. <clears throat> Think about it. This is all about following Jesus. What sort of team did he have to work with? How annoying a bunch of self-seeking, unrestrained, violent cases and fraudsters did he have trading around behind him? He worked with them. He had important things to do with a team like that. See, this stuff we're being asked for all comes down to us from Jesus. It springs out of following him. And his followers can sit around and say, who's going to have the best seat in heaven now? And they're, they're vying with each other, and they're rattling away with each other. And one's a, a tax collector, servant of the Roman regime, grinding the faces of the poor, right? Institutionally corrupt. 
And another one is the sort of guy who was a sort of a, a zealot, a Jewish terrorist, go around stabbing people poor and for being Romans in the crowd. You know, your, your ancient world equivalent of the suicide bomber. And they're in the same team. They're with each other. They're with one another. Difficult one? Forgiving each other. It's very easy to actually bear with one another, to put up with, and there's no forgiveness going on. And what happens then in that situation is that scores build up. Forgive, says Paul, as the Lord forgave you. There's a bit of a challenge. And finally, love is the crowning grace to put on. In this group of people, in your churches, which, you know, you've only got sinners to pick for a church, haven't you? Basically, you're going to have sinful people in there, and it's going to be hard going. Love each other. All these other things are a bit sort of negative. Don't rise to the bait and blah, 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 blah. But forgiving and loving, that's something you've got to go out there and do. Love is the crowning grace to put on, holding all of it together in, in perfect unity. And, and again, it's the object of that verb at the beginning, put on. Put this on. Put on love. Loving as God in Christ has loved you. It's the perfect bond that holds the rest together in unity. So here we go. <coughs> We've got a problem with churches that are full of fans, not followers of Jesus. They're along for the gig, they're along for the, you know, the buzz of it all. But that's as far as it goes. And Paul is saying, key to all the situation is, your old identity was like this, we've looked at it, we've described it, put it off. Your new identity, it springs out of who you are, just, just go with this. This is who you are now. As a follower of Jesus Christ. And it all comes to you by the grace and by the mercy of God, who's forgiven you, born with you, forgiven you, and loves you in the way you're now to go and mirror. Simply reflect. This is not some great big moral crusade, not some great big moral endeavour, go and do this, you know the rules, do these and you'll be alright. This is reflecting the forgiven, loved, chosen, set apart for a job person that you become in Christ. So it's really about following the Jesus who perfectly embodies all of these features and characteristics and has done so for you. It's all about being found, not found. I'll tell you what guys, <coughs> we'll uh, sing once more and then we'll...